Call our meeting back to order. Next item on the agenda, item C, E.A. Laney High School Biomedical Program Appendix D, Dr. Markley. Again, I'll turn this over to the principal at uh, Laney, Mr. Al O'Brien. Thank you, Dr. Markley, our Board of Education members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you guys today about our, our signature program. Um, it's been a, a journey, and I'd kind of like to, to outline the journey that we, we've taken to get to this point. I guess it was uh, a little over a year ago, Dr. Markley charged us with the, um, the thought and the idea of each high school having a signature program. And, and um, so we um, started looking at different possibilities for Laney High School. And as we were going through this process, we, of course, I had some ideas and we opened it up to our faculty and asked for them to uh, come to us with ideas that they had. So they submitted ideas of interest. And, and um, so we had a lot of faculty input. And, <laughs> And as we started going through the, the process, it became clear to us that we had left out a, uh, a large group of our stakeholders, and that was our students. Um, so we kind of stopped our process at that point and, and backed up and decided to, to survey our, our students to see what it was that they had an interest in doing when they finished high school, um, what um, careers that they might have an interest in, in, in being a part of, and allowing them to have some, some input into the process. So um, that's kind of the, the, the road that we took. So in this process, you'll see that we, uh, we've included student input and um, we think that's very important in this process. But we'll go ahead and, and, and start. Um, when we look at the, uh, the, the STEM program and when you look at medical science and biomedical, um, that was an area of interest for our students. This is something that they indicated to us that they had an interest in being a part of. This is what they wanted to do beyond high school. So this was very important to them. Um, so we started doing a little research on that. And as we, we've um, researched these areas, we found that they, were, um, that they were very popular and very important. And there was um, good career possibilities for students that were graduating, um, not only from high school, but from college and therefore beyond looking at um, careers in these fields, that there's a, a big possibility for kids. Uh, we quote CNN, I'm a CNN fan, um, I, I watch it every night, um, but when we look at it, we see that four of the top ten careers, um, best jobs in America are, are coming from, you know, medical science and STEM and biomedical type of fields. Uh, they also list the fastest growing careers, six of the top ten careers come from STEM, come from medical science, come from biomedical research, and then if you look at their top 100 careers, 70 or more of these jobs involve STEM training. And when I say STEM training, <laughs> we're talking about science, technol uh, technology, and math. And included in there, we would want to put our medical science and our biomedical um, programs as well. So we felt like there was a lot of interest and there was a lot of support, not only from our students, but if you research it, there's a lot of important things that are going on and there's a lot of, uh, there's, a, there's a good future there for kids. We uh, surveyed our current ninth through 12th grade students. Um, and it wasn't just in these areas. We gave them different possibilities that they could choose from. So we asked them to pick three areas that they had an interest in, in being involved in. And overwhelmingly, um, our students chose um, medical science and biomedical research. And they also chose their number two choice was STEM, which would be careers in you know, the science, technology, and math. Um, so based on that information, we decided that's how we were going to build our program. Um, so we took a look at it. Could you go back one slide for me? Thank you. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we, we took that information from our students and used that as we went forward. Thank you. We involved our, our staff. We formed a site team and on that site team we had um, not only teachers at our school and faculty members at our school, but we also included parents. We had parents come on to be a part of this process as well. So we, we involved parents in the process, we've involved students in the process. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we had all stakeholders involved. We uh, discussed it at our, our, um, our faculty meetings. We've discussed it in our school improvement process. We've discussed it in department head meetings. We wanted to make sure that we had all of our, our people on board and moving in the same direction. Um, so we, we felt like that through our process, we've been very intentional and incremental trying to bring all stakeholders together to, to be in support of this. 
Um, we took some time to research. We, we went to visit different schools. We um, sent a team to Goldsboro where they were already implementing the um, biomedical um, technology program. We sent some teachers up to that program uh, to visit and to see what they were doing. Um, we sent a team to um, Wake County to Athens Drive High School where they were uh, implementing the uh, medical science and also uh, sustainable energy program. So we visited their program, trying to learn from them what worked well, what didn't work well, learn from their mistakes so we don't repeat the same mistakes. Um, so we, uh, we took some time to, to visit the Athens Drive um, High School and, and uh, learned a lot from their program. Uh, we had a representative from North Carolina Science and, and Math to come down, North Carolina School of Science and Math to come down and, and uh, talk about what they could offer to us in a partnership uh, with our school. Uh, we were scheduled actually on February 11th to visit um, North Carolina School of Science and Math and also the City of Medicine High School in Durham um, to, to take a look at their program. So we've been very careful in our research and wanted to make sure that we were looking at programs that have already started this process to make sure that we were doing things the way that they, they needed to be done. We still need to send a team. Uh, well, like I said, we lost that day during the uh, during the, uh, the ice storm, so we, we still need to send a team to uh, North Carolina School of Science and Math and the City of Medicine High School. And we're looking forward to that so that we can find out a little bit more about uh, you know, what their program looks like and, and what they're doing. It's been a collaborative effort. We've worked closely with, uh, with senior staff here. Uh, I can tell you that um, our AIG coordinator here, uh, Sarah Gubitz, has been involved with us in this process the whole way. Uh, we feel like that this process uh, ties in nicely with the AIG curriculum. We feel like that um, we can um, utilize um, the services uh, of the AIG um, folks to, to make sure that this program goes forward the way it, it needs to so that we're addressing uh, all of our students. We have uh, incorporated um, support from Laverne Pickett, um, who is our Career Technical and Education uh, Director. She's been involved with helping us get the Biomedical Technology Program um, up, to, uh, up to where it needed to be so that we could get started with that. And of course, senior staff has also been very involved in this process as well. Our next steps are really to, to try to secure um, you know, funding for this position. We, we would need a, or for, for the program. The most important thing uh, that we learned in this process when we were visiting schools was you really need a coordinator of the program. It really doesn't need to be about uh, one particular person like a principal because principals sometimes move from school to school. We need somebody that can sustain the program, that can be there to kind of make sure the program continues. So uh, we would need a coordinator for this program. That's the one thing that we think is the most important thing. And when we've talked to other schools that are implementing these programs, typically they have at least a half-time coordinator or a full-time coordinator that helps them uh, to, to, to establish the, um, the things that need to be established, whether it's community partnerships, internships, um, helping select the students for the program, pushing into the STEM classrooms, making sure that uh, the program uh, moves forward in a positive direction. Of course, there, there could be cost with transportation uh, and other things as well, uh, professional development. But the main, the main critical piece of this for us would be a, a coordinator of sorts to help us get the program up and running and keep it running. Um, we would like to start with our ninth grade group next year and possibly some of our 10th graders, but we do want to focus on our ninth graders. Um, and again, we want to make sure that in this program that we have a community partnership piece of this because we think that that's very important that our kids have an opportunity to, to have an internship experience. When we talk about a coordinator and what this person would do, we, we've tried to list some of the things, and this is not a, uh, a comprehensive list. We, we've tried to list a lot of ideas. I'm certainly not going to go through and, and, and read all of these things to you, but there's a lot of things we feel like this coordinator could do for us uh, within this program and also outside of the program, not only touching based on, on the STEM initiative and the, and the medical science and the biomedical research, but also um, with the, uh, the AIG piece as well. We feel like that this person could also help us with, with AIG responsibilities and um, could help assume some of those roles and responsibilities as well. And this is just a possible uh, coursework for students as they go through. They're still going to take the North Carolina required courses that they need uh, to earn their diploma. Uh, if they're on the STEM or the biomedical science side, bless you. Um, if they're on the, 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 the medical science or the biomedical science side, um, certainly that their courses would reflect more of that through health science, um, through the nursing fundamentals program, uh, and some of the courses that we have listed on that side. On the STEM math and science, that may take more of an engineering focus 
where they uh, focus a little bit more on some, some uh, drafting courses, forensics, physics. Uh, all of these programs would include uh, an internship probably after their junior year where they would spend time working hopefully with professionals in the community so that they can uh, learn more uh, about the, uh, the areas that they're uh, hoping to be a, a part of later on in life. And of course, we would like to uh, have their graduation project also be a STEM or a medical science type of, of graduation project as well. So we would like to, to tie that experience uh, together. Lots of positives, um, of course, and, and only one challenge as we see it. Um, certainly, it's, it's been a, a process of us of, of collecting data from, uh, from our staff and from our students. We feel like that we've done that. Um, we feel like that this is a great way to, to tie in AIG services for some of our AIG kids and some of our STEM students. Um, we've had staff support and involvement not only at the central office level, but also uh, from the school level. Uh, we see these areas as a critical need for the future. Uh, this is what the, the research shows, that this is where the jobs are going to be, this is where they need, um, this is where they're going to need uh, you know, employment in, in, the, in the future. These are going to be critical need areas. We're trying to meet that need as well. When we look at uh, the, 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 uh, the jobs that are out there, we feel like that's very important. We've researched this through visiting other sites. Um, we've explored uh, possible STEM partnerships with our feeder middle schools. As you guys probably know, Trask Middle School has the biotechnology program already offered, and also I think the, uh, the robotics program offered over at, at Trask Middle School. So this would be a continuation of that possibility for them. Um, again, partnership possibilities with North Carolina School of Science and Math. And again, most importantly for us, also an opportunity for community partnerships with STEM and, and medical professionals that are out there in the field. And, and we've also already started a little bit of that process where we're talking to medical professionals and, uh, and different organizations. And everybody we've talked to has been overwhelmingly supportive of, of being a part of this process of, of welcoming the students into their, their, um, their, uh, their programs when that becomes available. So we feel like there's a lot of support for it in the community as well. And of course, the only challenge, of course, would be funding that position for us, but we feel like it's critical. Uh, for us, we're ready to go. Um, we've, we've been intentional, we've been incremental, we have spent time uh, uh, doing all of these things. We're ready to go. We feel like we can implement next year with, uh, with the support of the Board of Education. So I'll take questions if you have any. Mr. Higgins? Uh, two questions. Yes, sir. Um, how many students would you start with? Uh, we'd like to start with a group of 60 coming into the ninth grade, um, and certainly we'd like to expand. Uh, we feel like if we have that coordinator position, we feel like that we could, we feel like we could expand that even the, the following year if we needed to. So unlike the IB program we've heard, it's just a junior, senior, this would be a ninth through twelfth grade program? We would like to, to, to start it off in ninth grade and then build the program forward as we go. So we would like to start small as well. Instead of starting with all four grade levels, we would want to you know, start with just a smaller group. And but, so. Would, would there be, again, the necessity of creating a space for them, or would they just simply travel to the school like other students? No, sir. We would not need to create a space, although we will have to, when we look at the biomedical research, you know, we will have to designate classroom space for some of these courses as they come on board. So. My, my other question is that there's a, lot, there's a great deal of discussion about the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, mm -hmm. but I am wondering there's nothing about UNCW or Cape Fear Community College coordinating to help make these programs go. And so I just wonder, have, you know, is there any discussion of coordinating with either one of those institutions? And that's a great question, Mr. Higgins. And we have actually had dialogue with uh, Cape Fear Community College. We've had um, some, we've, I've communicated via email with um, some folks out at New Hanover Regional Medical Center as well. We've not communicated with UNCW. That is a, a step that needs to occur still, but we have communicated with both of those groups and, and they have, um, well, I can't speak for New Hanover Regional Medical Center, obviously, um, but I have exchanged some emails with some folks over there. We've just not had an opportunity to, to get together and meet. But Cape Fear Community College, um, of course, was, was open to partnering um, with our students taking classes through the um, Career and College Promise Program. So they were open to, to, to that. Um, where the transportation may come in, as you probably know very well, most of the medical science courses are offered at the downtown campus. There are only a few offered at the northern campus, which is very convenient <coughs> to our school. 
Um, so hopefully over the years, if there's a need, maybe that'll be a possibility. But again, I can't, I can't speak to that. But we have been in dialogue with Cape Fear Community College. Good. Uh, yes, ma'am. Transportation, and that's that's a little bit to be determined. That's a good question, Ms. Kavanaugh. But for example, if we can partner with Cape Fear Community College, there might be a need for our students to be bused to Cape Fear Community College if that's a possibility. If they can't teach the classes on our campus, which I don't, they currently don't do, we might need to bus our students to some of those locations um, in order for them to take courses over there uh, when we develop those future partnerships. By starting with the ninth grade, that gives us a little bit of an opportunity to develop those partnerships a little bit more, um, well, a little bit more effectively as we move forward. By starting with the ninth graders, we hope to establish that by the time they're in the 11th and 12th grade. So that's where transportation would probably come in. Mr. O'Brien, um, is this going to be open to all students within the county as well? Certainly, we're an open choice school just like other schools are, so. Um, okay, and we would not provide transportation. But if they're Correct. starting at the ninth grade, how do you ensure if they don't stay with the program, mm -hmm. do they go back to their s district school? How is this going well, to work? Well, we would use the normal open choice um, procedures that would go <laughs> on. So typically, if a student commits to us open choice, they stay with us and they're our student. Uh, in order for them to go back to their school, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Holliday, they would have to um, go back through the, uh, I guess, through student services to go back to their their district at school. Is that correct, sir? So. Yeah. I think this was something that had to really be thought through ahead of time mm -hmm. to ensure that they're really serious about it and what sure. would happen if, if it doesn't work out for them. But sure. Professor O'Brien, I'd just like to take a moment to thank you for, um, you know, we've had a lot of discussion about signature academies and, and we've had a lot of presentations over the past, uh, or at least I have, over the past year mm -hmm. and a half. Um, and, and I just would like to thank you for addressing the, the, the stakeholder that oftentimes gets missed the most, and that is the students. Well, thank you. Thank um, you. you know, I, I think the fact that you um, recognize that the success of the program really relies on the interest of the student early on um, will mean uh, great success for the program, and I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to uh, have Mr. O'Brien as my uh, my son's principal and I have well, a couple you. of boys who are coming up and, and they're very excited about the possibility of this program but he's also been gracious enough to sort of keep me informed on this and um, I, I think your approach is spot on and I appreciate your efforts. Well thank you. Thanks ma'am. Ms. Eastfield, did you have a question earlier? No. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Of this evening? No sir. <coughs> <coughs> thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Item D, recommendations for school year 2014-15 uh, to accommodate continued growth. Mr. Hans. As it's coming forward, this is provided as information, but it will transition to an <coughs> action item next month. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, or good afternoon, I guess. <laughs> um, <coughs> enrollment projections for New Hanover County Schools um, were, was updated uh, based on the 2010 uh, population census that we had for the county. Uh, the enrollment projections indicate that we have continued growth in the county from the 24,285 students in 2010 and 11, we're projected to grow by 2020, 2021 to in excess of 27,000 students. And in order to accommodate uh, this growth, um, we have to have additional construct, additional capacity provided, and in order to provide that capacity, uh, it's going to be a combination of uh, new construction for elementary schools, replacement of a couple of schools, and uh, additions and renovations to existing facilities. <coughs> However, in order to uh, accommodate that on a year-by-year -year basis, we're going to be evaluating the expected growth for the following year each and each and every year. And we're going to be coming to you and making recommendations on a yearly basis and how to accommodate the growth that we expect. And that's what this is. It's a recommendation for 2014, 2015, and how we can accommodate or methods or recommendations for you to consider 
how we can accommodate the expected growth that, uh, that we're planning, that we anticipate for next year. Those recommendations, in order for us to formulate those recommendations, we had to make certain assumptions. One of those assumptions was that we would have a bond in 2014. Another one of the assumptions was that we would, that the uh, scheduling would, for, the, for that particular bond and the projects within the bond would align so that we could have only one major elementary school redistricting system-wide and that would be in August of 2019. Another assumption would also be <coughs> that the projects within the bond would provide the capacity at the time period that we would need to redistrict, which would be August of 2019, from uh, the new elementary schools to uh, replacement of two schools, which would be Blair and College Park, and the additions and renovations. And another assumption was that we would, that we would on an annual basis, do whatever was necessary to accommodate that growth to put off that major redistricting until 2019 until we did have the capacity within the system to accommodate it. And that could be a combination of adding mobile units to schools or uh, minor redistricting, uh, minor adjustments of district lines, not truly redistricting, but just adjustments of district lines, and using uh, non-traditional uh, spaces within the schools, which we currently do, as you well know, we currently use art rooms, we use music rooms, we use uh, computer labs, and convert those into traditional uh, classrooms in order to accommodate the growth. Some schools uh, have the ability to do that uh, much easier, and the flexibility is afforded them much easier based on the configuration of the school than other schools. So we come to you with uh, basically three recommendations for next year. One of the recommendations would be to reopen the College Road facility into an early childhood center. And that would accommodate the pre-K students from Mary C. Williams and the kindergarten students from Bellamy Elementary School. As you're aware, Bellamy currently is the, probably the school right now that is in, in, has the most issues with its run out of non-traditional spaces mm -hmm. to the right. point where they're <coughs> having to hold a class in the, in the media center. Right. Those, those particular, those two schools do, are not configured to such a degree that they can have the flexibility that's afforded by other schools and the configuration of those other schools in order to allow them to use those spaces. We've already, we're already using everything we can at Bellum and you have a class even in the media center there currently. <coughs> I'm gonna skip to the, the third recommendation would be to place some uh, mobile units at Bradley Creek and at Murrayville. Neither of these particular schools um, <coughs> allow themselves, based on their geographic location, allow themselves to be, uh, their district lines to be adjusted uh, easily. Therefore, we're um, recommending that we place some mobile units there to accommodate the growth for next year. And then in 2019, when you have a major elementary school redistricting, you can repurpose those mobile units uh, to other locations as necessary. So, Mr. The, Hans, then the Consideration for that quad unit, mm -hmm. I think what that so that won't be in consideration anymore because if we're going to move in 29 um, for Bradley Creek, yes, no, we we will we're recommending that we place some mobile units there. Whether or not it would be a quad unit, we'll need okay. to look at it and see. But we are recommending to, for next year to place mobile units at Bradley Creek and mobile units at Murrayville Elementary School in order to accommodate the expected growth at those two particular sites. Mm -hmm. And those mobile units we would anticipate would remain there until at least 2019 when you go through a major uh, redistricting effort after mm -hmm. the bond projects are completed and the capacity for the system is provided. That, that was, uh, well, I understand that part, but my question was, if we put the quad, which is four classrooms, that mm -hmm. would be more of a challenge to place it for the need somewhere else. Would it not? Well, you could, you could, you could move it. Any, yeah. If we put a quad down there, you could still move the quad. A little more, you more take more effort, but you could, you, you could okay. move the quad. Mm -hmm. So at this time, we don't know how many would be at either. No, of we'll the we'll come back with a recommendation for exactly how many we'll okay. we'll put we'll place there. Uh, <clears throat> the last recommendation, uh, which is listed number two in your in your packet, is the adjustment of district lines. We would move students from um, Pine Valley into Holly Tree and into Parsley 
and from Bellamy into Parsley. Now, in your packet, you, you also have, I'm not going to go through all of the, read these to you, but uh, you do have a data sheet that is listed there. And you can see the students and where, which study areas they would come from. You have a total movement of 73 students. And you have the backouts, of course, which gives you a net of about <coughs> 59 students that would actually be affected by these minor adjustments and would uh, shift. And by backout students, those are students which go to a magnet school, uh, to Gregory, or to go to a year-round school, Coddington and Eaton, but they actually are housed in that particular study area, but they, by choice, they go to another school, or it could be from employee benefit, where they go with their parent to a school. Uh, Typically, uh, uh, tweaks of this size would fall under superintendent's discretion based on policy, but since it's tied to opening up basically a new facility, it really needs to be considered as part of that entire piece. And we'll show you the maps for that in just a minute. Uh, a transportation plan would also need to be worked out for, um, for the movement, um, for the first recommendation when you're talking about uh, moving the students to, uh, from Bellamy uh, to um, the College Road facility, the kindergarten students, and the pre-kindergarten students from uh, Mira C. Williams. I won't read through the transportation plan. It's there for your perusal, but it is the same plan that is currently used to move the pre-K students um, from Eaton to Johnson, and it's been working very, very well, so we'll utilize the same. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. We're going to utilize the same, the same system. Um, you also have in there a floor plan for the uh, College Road site, which basically shows that you have about 11 teaching spaces there for the kindergarten and the pre-K students. Now, if you look at the, at the map, the very first map that you have in there, this particular map shows you the current um, district lines as they currently exist. This is Pine Valley, the purple. This is Holly Tree in the green, Parsley in the red, and this is Bellamy in the yellow. Yes, they do not have a kitchen facility there. They have a facility that we can use as a warming kitchen. It's a very small area there that's set up as a, as a commercial kitchen area. And um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Smith will transport in from another, from another uh, site. We'll bring food in. We'll provide it just as we did at that time. It worked very well. The next map that you have shows you the study areas that will be uh, affected. You can see here that uh, this study area, 274, will be moved from Pine Valley into Holly Tree, and study area 276 from Pine Valley into Holly Tree. You can see the students that are affected as well. And this from Pine Valley into Parsley, this particular study area, which is uh, 279. These uh, two study areas are Bellamy study areas, and they will be going into uh, Parsley. Both Holly Tree and Parsley are able to better accommodate uh, the students based on the actual configuration of the school. They have uh, the ability to absorb more, more students, and Pine Valley and Bellamy, uh, Pine Valley as well as Bellamy, of course, are projected to uh, have an increased student population. And we school. have we reviewed this plan with all of the principals and yes. made a couple of tweaks based on their recommendations. All right. And the last map that you have shows the district the district lines as they would exist after an approved change. Yes, Ms. Kavanaugh. Why is that southernmost boundary of the red? What, what street is that? I, I can't tell. Uh, I would have to look and see. That street is, uh, it's just north of Cherokee. I can't really read it. It's in the red and it's a, it's a okay. blur. But we can find oh, out this, this particular street it's right here. Navajo. It might be Navajo. It looks yeah, like Navajo comes around. Navajo. Okay, comes around there. Uh, and of course, College Road makes a good, uh, good geographical boundary. So, Mr. Hans, the students, when we moved them at one time from Parsley to Bellamy, that study area, will those same families or addresses come back to Parsley? Probably, because we probably moved these areas. I have to look back and see which study areas we moved, but we moved more than two in that, in that particular move, but that was several years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, been, it's been long enough that all of those students Children are no longer graduate. elementary students. Right, but, but, <laughs> but the families could be the same, yes. 
but there's <clears throat> there's no need to bring J.C. Rowe into this mix. Not at so this that's time. The only other option is really that. Uh, it is not at this time, but we have informed the people that are currently leasing J.C. Rowe that. Uh, uh, December 31st, 2015 is the last day of the lease, and we will be taking it back at that point in time. Uh, looking at the schedule that Mr. Anderson put together, implementation schedule for the projected bond, uh, we anticipate at that point in time uh, needing it uh, to house maybe some of our pre-K students, depending upon what site we utilize as a swing site. If we're going to have to utilize uh, Johnson Elementary uh, site as a swing site for uh, College Park, then uh, we will need to place row into service and house uh, pre-K students or and or kindergarten students or Head Start students or someone in those particular in that particular facility. We will be using during the implementation of the bond and the growth and handling our growth for the next uh, 10 years, we will be utilizing every single facility which we have. You know, in, in thinking about uh, the bond, I don't really see, I was just sitting here kind of thinking about what is included in that. The only really new facility that's going to in increase space would be the school at the northern end of the county. We College will. College Park and Blair are just going to be replacements. They'll be replacements. <laughs> we may gain some capacity uh, with those replacements because the schools will be different configurations. There'll be a new, a new school, different configuration than the current ones that are there, although their populations at those particular schools are fairly high at this point in time. So you may not realize you will not realize a great increase in capacity at those particular schools, but those schools will be built so that they can handle more students. You may, in, Mr. Anderson, in his uh, design of those particular schools, may in fact look at the core areas and expanding some of the core areas so that we can accommodate uh, the growth there or accommodate additional students uh, a little bit better. Okay. That is one of the limiting factors that we have in some of our elementary schools, particularly with uh, uh, Miracy Williams and um, Bellamy is the core areas being the cafeteria and the kitchen and the media center and the influx of students and the ability of those cores, core areas to support the students that you put on the site. That is one of the reasons that we're not recommending additional mobile units be placed at Williams and be placed at Bellamy because you're going to max out the, the core area capability at those particular sites. That's why we're recommending uh, adjustments at this time and opening the uh, College Road site as an early childhood center. Well, whereas, I'm not, I'm sorry. I mean, whereas we can add some classrooms at uh, Bradley Creek, uh, mobile classrooms at Bradley Creek and at Murrayville Elementary. Yes, ma'am. Why would it not overtax the core of Parsley? It's a little bit larger core. It's a, it's a core that can handle more than students. Parsley already has some, some uh, mobile units that are there that they're currently do not have students in them. As you recall, we moved the Bellamy kindergarten students over there while we handled some mold issues in some of the mobile units at Bellamy. We housed those students in four mobile units over at Parsley. And Parsley's core area is a little bit larger than schools configured such that it can handle that. The core area at, uh, at Bellamy is uh, much smaller. Bellamy does not have a multi-purpose room. All they have is cafeteria there. So it's, uh, it's smaller. And Mary C. Williams, as you know, is a pod school. So their, their capabilities are, are limited as, mm -hmm. as well. So each and every year, uh, Mr. Anderson from his, from his department is going to work hard and we're gonna come, <coughs> to come back to you each and every year with uh, recommendations as to how we can accommodate the anticipated growth for the following year, what we need to do, whether it's move mobile units, whether it's make some small adjustments such as this in order to more accommodate the capacity in the students uh, in the schools uh, so that we can make it a little bit better for them. Mr. Hance, uh, yes, I know uh, we've been in, in discussion with the County Commission about uh, you know our overcrowding issues. Have you uh, presented this information to them in, in your ongoing discussions with uh, with them and, and you know just to demonstrate the um, in a graphic way, the issues that we deal with. Uh, obviously, redistricting or, or moving the district lines is not ideal, um, and we don't like to have to do that, but um, I think this, this uh, information would be very helpful for them to see, and I, I wonder if we, maybe this is a question for Don and, and um, Dr. Markley, but. Well, we, ha we have in our discussions with them, we have talked with them uh, about the implementation schedule. We have explained to them the, um, how we would like to redistrict all the system once rather than right. several times 
and we've told them about the implementation work schedule. We've impressed upon them uh, our timeline for implementing that, and that's been part of our discussions with the staff over there. And I think it was it was also part of the discussion and part of the presentation um, that we had at the at College Park with the county commissioners when they were there. Uh, that was all included, and I think the implementation schedule was even mentioned right. there, and the information was provided to them. Uh, in a packet, I believe that they that they have seen. So I believe the county staff is well aware of our of our concerns relative to the implementation schedule and the timeline for a new elementary school and the replacement of College Park and Blair and how that schedule and the swing sites all come together. Because when, as you recall, when we presented that timeline to you and. Mr. Anderson showed you a long timeline, which was about an eight-year implementation schedule, and then showed you the five-year timeline, which was uh, really more realistic for us and more practical, and we meshed those together. That same timeline, I believe, has been presented to the county, I believe. I think they have seen that, and they have, they have that this, in hard copy This specific well. proposal, they haven't seen this <coughs> specific right. proposal. Well, my point is, you know, th this is, um, is, is a very good way to demonstrate how this impacts families, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a very graphic way. It's, it's, it's one sure. thing to say, well, you know, we have overcrowding in this school, we have overcrowding in that school, we need to move children. Mm -hmm. But this is how, this is w the impact that it has sure. on those students. And the longer we postpone, the more we're going to have to continue to, to make these little adjustments here and there. And, you know, it, this kind of uh, upheaval is, is not good for, for families. Yeah. And uh, I, I think it would be helpful for them to see this. That's uh, this right. proposal specifically. Well, we can do that if they would like that. We can certainly do that at any point in time they would like to. We can we can certainly do that and make that available to them or present it to them however however you'd like that. We we can certainly do it. And you're absolutely correct. This is going to occur, and we will be coming back with some recommendations mm -hmm. probably each year to that. And one of the reasons we didn't make some adjustment recommendations for uh, Bradley Creek and Murrayville Elementary School is that. All of the districts around them, all of the attendance zones around them are full. Mm -hmm. So in order to make adjustments <laughs> to those, we could make adjustments to those, but it would be a cascading effect and almost like dominoes because we would go into another district, we would have to shift to another district, we would probably affect three to four attendance zones by making one adjustment to Bradley Creek or, right. uh, or Murrayville Elementary School. Yeah, and that's, that's the dilemma in which, that's the dilemma that we have right now. So uh, we're fortunate in this respect that we have the early childhood center and we can make those adjustments and move the students there and that worked very well when parsley was very overcrowded uh, six seven eight years ago uh, and it should work very well now we're fortunate we have that and we're fortunate that we can make these adjustments right now um, but this will be an annual uh, yeah. Unfortunately, an annual event. Strategy is what you're trying to say. <laughs> we'll, right. We did Freeman you, last year when we moved right. students. Now we're now we're tweaking down at this end of the county. Right. They, and they are very aware. I know that uh, <coughs> Chairman White with the county commissioners. That's why he and, and uh, Vice Chair Dawson. I know uh, Commissioner Wolf has been very helpful as far as property in the northern end and so forth. <coughs> They're very aware <coughs> of our of our problems and or regardless of the bond it said you know move forward <clears throat> but all due haste on that northern northern site Mr. this Hale, i think would so also be helpful because mm -hmm. it shows on a smaller detail but what caught my eye also mr hess was that number three here where it talks about consider mobile classroom units in the capital budget for bradley creek and murrayville mm -hmm. i think we also need to be aware that, uh, that we have not arrived at a figure yet for the bond <coughs> So there might be something more we could do because uh, I don't really see us gaining that that much additional space other than the new elementary school mm -hmm. you know, as far as what we could do maybe at Blair and uh, College Park mm -hmm. uh, Mr. but Hamp, we I'm, don't have I'm a lot sorry. of space. You keep hesitating and I think you're through and I, I'm I don't mean to step on you. Uh, uh, go right ahead because uh, I'm, I'm having problems that's why I'm hesitating. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hans, yes, Ms. Kavanaugh. without revealing anything <coughs> confidential, how are we doing on the, the search for land in the northern part of the county? We'll have a discussion about that in mm -hmm. closed session. We'll, we'll discuss okay. that in closed session today, Ms. Kavanaugh, if you don't mind. I said without saying anything confidential. I know, that's why I didn't say anything. <laughs> I was shutting up. Any other comments or questions? <laughs> 
Was that it, Mr. Hens? That, that, that's it. I'll remain for the next one. I think it's first. Don't go anywhere because right. my I'm next item on agenda item is uh, update on facilities, Mr. Hens. Yes, uh, during the uh, during the uh, ice crisis, we um, we did open some shelters. Uh, we stood up at the EOC. Uh, we lost a couple of days of school and uh, operations department worked pretty much full time. We did uh, try to, uh, we, initial thought from the uh, emergency operations center was that we would open uh, Johnson and uh, Noble uh, shelters. Um, the generator at Johnson uh, failed and we were not able to open Johnson and the generator at Noble also experienced some difficulties. And these are generators that the county put in place at those particular schools so that if they're used as shelters, they pretty much cycle to the generator power immediately and they work off generator power rather than working off the grid in uh, expectation that the grid will go down and then they would have no interruption in power at a particular shelter. They had issues with those particular uh, generators. The one at Noble was working, but an alternator part on the generator just went just went bad and it just failed. Um, the one at uh, Johnson had some more extensive problems. So we were able to shift to Coddington and Coddington opened as a shelter. Noble was a shelter for a few hours and they had uh, probably 10 people at Noble. Uh, when we switched over and Coddington became the primary shelter, uh, we switched everything down from Noble and shut Noble down and it wound up with a total of about 17 people uh, total that utilized the shelter. We had, uh, of course, our administrative personnel were at the shelters, our custodians were at the shelters, and our child nutrition personnel were at the shelters, along with uh, DSS representatives who ran the shelter, and eventually there might have been some Red Cross representatives there that ran the shelter as well, and of course uh, deputies that were there at the shelter. So you have a large number of people from within the county and from various agencies that staff and man and actually operate a shelter when it uh, when it comes online and it goes up. And we also have a representative that, uh, that uh, we have a seat in the emergency operations center when the shelter is open. One of our people is usually, usually there. Uh, and this time it was uh, Mr. Spencer and myself that uh, sat in the, uh, the EOC for the time period that was, that was necessary. And when you open a shelter, you always have everything's running, everybody's running around uh, initially to get it up and running, making sure Ms. Smith's making sure we got food and we've got child nutrition people there in order to prepare the food so that when the first person walks in the door, <coughs> there is food uh, and beverages for them. Um, and our maintenance personnel make sure that there's heat and everything is there. And the custodians are there to take care of, uh, of maintenance and cleanup of, of the site. So we did pretty well um, with that. In that regard, uh, the impact to our schools, um, we were very fortunate. Uh, we had no appreciable damage to any of our facilities from the uh, storm. We did have debris and limbs down uh, all over the place. Uh, maintenance crews were out uh, taking care of that um, um, at Laney and at Hoggard. Uh, we had partial power in some cases, and so our switchgear, anytime we have power fluctuations and the power goes down, uh, we have to go back and we have to reseat some things. Uh, we had the worst case scenario for us during the, during the event, we had about 22 schools that were without power on uh, Thursday morning and we had to get those up. And one of the issues that Duke Power had, uh, Duke Power Progress uh, had was uh, their crews uh, going out and getting to, the, getting to the repairs was the wind was blowing very, very hard and there was still a lot of ice in the trees and so they were making assessments as to outages at that time, but they weren't necessarily repairing. So as, as the time went on, of course, the crews got out there and started repairing uh, everything, and we got everything back up and, up and running. Uh, and our maintenance crews were out there the whole time as well, going into the schools when the power would come back on, reseating, doing all the switches. We also had crews out cleaning up the debris that was there. We also had contracts with four different contractors that hit the ground running uh, uh, Thursday morning <coughs> and cleaning up debris and taking down limbs. We had some situations where we had uh, debris in the limb and the limbs were hanging, they were broken, they were hanging over critical sites where we couldn't allow people to traverse under them. So we, we were concerned about that, but we were able to get the crews in there, get the buckets up and get, the, get that taken care of. One was right over at Forest Hills as you can imagine, with all the trees around Forest Hills, there's typically problems with debris uh, when you have an ins uh, incident or a storm like this. 
So we were able to get that taken care of and cleaned up so that that was not a concern for the opening of school. Uh, the main thing we were concerned about were power lines that were not necessarily broken, but were sagging and maybe tran uh, transversing a road, which would a car could probably go around, but a bus might not be able to go around. <coughs> so those were some of the concerns and everything that we had and that we were looking at. And uh, of course, uh, the Sheriff's Department worked with us very, very well. They're out on the roads. They can tell us the condition of the roads. Uh, Duke Power was out there. Uh, our Transportation Department was out there riding the roads. Uh, at one point, I asked them, could they r run every route? And I was quickly informed that, of course, <laughs> they could not run every route. It would take about 60 people, and we, we drive 11,000 miles every single day. And to run every single route that we have, past all 4,000 stops that we have every single day was really not doable. And I thought for a second and thought, hmm, why did I even ask the question? Yes, it was silly. But um, we didn't have any uh, appreciable issues when we had school yesterday, and it was a good call for us to have it. I think it was a good call that school was canceled on Wednesday and on Thursday. Thursday, we wouldn't have had the power at the schools. We just we wouldn't have been able to operate. So. I think we did pretty good, Dr. Hickey. I think we did all right with it. We had our issues, but uh, everybody pretty much pulled together and we came through and no really appreciable damage to the schools and the debris. We still have limbs and things down, but they're not, it's not blocking any access. It's not creating any particular issues right now. It's just going through the cleanup. How many of our schools have emergency generators? Only the ones that are designated as shelters, and that's um, Johnson, Trask, Noble, Eaton and Coddington. Those are the only ones that have sh uh, generators there. One of the issues, which will be an issue for a debrief when we have a uh, debrief, and we always have a debrief after, after an event like this with the county at the EOC, and one of the things that will come up will be that uh, the generators, of course, were placed there in anticipation of power outages during hurricanes. So they were wired up, not to the heating system, but to the air conditioning system, and a couple of our sites. So. <laughs> <laughs> Being able to provide heat with the generator was not necessarily the case at a couple of sites, but at um, they were hooked up a little, a little bit differently at uh, Coddington. Yeah, in my time so. here, we, I've actually <laughs> been out of school more for snow and ice than hurricanes. Eight Did days you, for you snow and ice. Did you bring it with you or something? What <laughs> happened? <laughs> so the other question is, who, who's responsible for the upkeep of these generators? Uh, the county is. The county's placed them, the county purchased the generators, the county put them in place, uh, and they're responsible for the uh, maintenance and the upkeep of those particular generators. We, of course, work with them on that. Uh, whenever they're going to start it up, we usually have our guys there because it affects our building and our power. It's attached to it, and we've worked with them very closely ever since they did that. Initially, when we had the hurricanes back in the late 90s and we had power issues and everything, the county had a contract with uh, different vendors which would bring in generators just prior to a storm and put them in place at the designated shelters. And um, that worked sometimes and sometimes it didn't work. Sometimes they didn't make it. So sometimes that was an issue. So the county opted over time through capital expenditures uh, to place the generators uh, on site, which was a much better situation, I think. They also work with us and place a generator. Um, it's not one permanently in place, but they bring one in for like a hurricane and place it at our child nutrition department right over here because we have a very large freezer there and we usually have during the summer and the hurricane months we usually have a large amount of food there which in a real situ emergency situation here would be tasked to feed you know the community as necessary so they bring in a generator and we hook it up there so that we don't have as much food spoilage when we uh, you know when we have significant power outages so that's something that we work with them on as well. At some point, we will get a permanent generator probably over there. But maybe after we, maybe we, after we build a new building and get them in a, something other than a temporary building that they're in. Well, I'm sure this is also for the debrief, but uh, I'd like to see if maybe we could do something to help to uh, make these generators actually function. I mean, it's sort of, uh, uh, it, it didn't hurt anyone in this particular case because the, the outages maybe weren't as widespread as they could be. But it is a little bit concerning that two generators essentially failed. Oh, that was, 
that was very concerning to the to the EOC, and it was very it was brought up, and I think there will be a lot of discussion relative to uh, to the generator situation and the type of generator that you have, the size of the generator that you have, and how it is actually hooked up, and which parts of the building that it actually runs. These it's are not really tested. Uh, how often, Bill? Does, does, does they come in and test them? I think test them every month, Dave. Do you know? On the radio today, they said uh, every week. Once a week. Once a week. Once yeah. A week? Once a week, so. Who, who monitors uh, that? The county. 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 But county the engineering department. The max number we had, if I heard you correctly, was uh, five. Five. No, no, it. Uh, uh, oh, seventeen. Coddington, seventeen people. Seventeen people. What? I mean, we'd have been cheaper to go to Carolina Beach and get some motel rooms. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're thirty-nine dollars a night on the right, going in across that when you cross the bridge. <laughs> Actually, a lot of the hotels were were booked. Mm -hmm. yeah. Quite a few people yeah, actually were. Uh, got hotel. What, a, what occurred? Man, they may have given us yeah. a deal. They were doing, they what, got one thing that occurred, and Mr. Spencer can <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, because he was involved in these discussions the night that they that they made the decision to open the shelter, because we weren't sure if the shelter was going to be open. We knew a state of emergency had been declared by the, by the county commissioners, but we didn't know if a shelter was going to be uh, needed. But one of, the, one of the impetuses for opening the shelter was that uh, the hospital had identified uh, some um, elderly housing areas that were without power for the approximately 175 residents and they and they were most of them were in a fragile <coughs> medical situation and so they um, anticipated that those 175 uh, residents would be moved to a shelter uh, that never occurred uh, then so that was a discussion about keeping the shelter open and should we keep it open because at one time there was only three individuals in the shelter. Um, then later we had uh, housing authority units that actually had no power and no heat. And so we did not have a number of uh, individuals affected by that but it was a fairly large number um, and so there was anticipation that those individuals would be coming to Coddington and as a result Three or four of them actually did come to Coddington, but the full complement did not. So we wound up with a total of 17 people. And even during a hurricane, you have varying numbers. It depends upon the size of the hurricane, the type of the hurricane that comes, as to whether or not you have a large number of occupants at the shelter. We have two shelters that are pet shelters now. Trask and Noble can both be used for pet relocation uh, facilities. In other words, your pet can be there and you can be there at the shelter. Um, we did not operate the pet portion of the shelter this time. That was uh, the pets were taken to the sheriff's department and animal control. But those are two things that can happen as, as well. And typically with a hurricane, we've had as many as two or 300 people in the shelters. Uh, some, that's why you have to open multiple shelters because some shelters are uh, can handle only about 120 people. It depends upon the nature of the emergency. Because if you have a hurricane with high winds involved, you're only, on, only going to place the people in the hallways. You're not going to put them in the classrooms where you have windows. You're not going to put them in the large span facility like a gym. So we're limited in the uh, number of people that can actually utilize a shelter. Well, and, I, and I wasn't being critical. I just, because like you said, I'd also heard on the news about the uh, some of the senior citizens in some of these areas that mm -hmm. several days ago they had no power and they did not remove them from the facility they just uh, mm -hmm. they stayed there yeah well i want to say thank you to all the personnel that came yeah. out during those two days um it, there were a lot of people that did a lot of hard work i know technology was out running around and i know the principals were, were out and and you mr hansen mr spencer for being at the shelters and trying to make sure everything runs smoothly I, you know child nutrition everyone that helped i just want to say thanks thank you it's it's definitely a team effort because everybody everybody is involved you know we have people from the instructional side that are involved as well because the administrators are there at the schools and people from operations and technology and, and everybody everybody's involved had this situation gone on longer I'm certain mr. Holiday dr. Holiday and dr. Wilmers would have both been in the EOC serving a shift <laughs> I had them at the top of my list. <laughs> no, I think uh, I think Lisa makes a good point. You know, uh, we're going to cover this later about how we do these makeup school days, and that's a big issue for everyone. But it, it's it's a lot of efforts when 22 schools don't have power on Thursday, and there's debris all over the place. 
to just flip the switch on Friday and say, hey, we're going to have school. And uh, you know, parents and children and the, who are impacted by this don't realize just how much effort uh, our staff and our principals uh, put into these things. And so I think the C-Step's right on the mark, and we should say thank you to everyone who made this possible. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you, Ms. Tance. Thank you. Item 7, Superintendent's Report. Item A, Legislative Priorities, Dr. Markley. All right, got a handout coming down, and you will also see this on the screen. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about this right now because we'll roll into this when we get into the retreat portion of our uh, meeting. But I wanted to put these out there for you just so we've got our legislative breakfast on the 18th, and as part of that, we always talk to them about some of our priorities. Uh, I also wanted to take that opportunity. There were some good things that came out of this budget last year. SROs, which will be in place pretty soon. Uh, panic alarms. They did eliminate the discretionary reduction, and they were, did do some things with, around flexibility. Same thing with the county. The county was very generous to us last year. Heading into 14 and 15, based on my conversations with teachers, principals, senior staff, these are what we see as some of the priorities. Uh, when we get to the retreat portion, we can spend a little more time going in depth on these. So that's just a sit here, you can write on this and just keep adding to it or subtracting to it, and then we'll uh, finalize that a little more after the regular meeting. Any comments or questions for Dr. Markle? Item 8, uh, under consensus items. Item A, personnel, fitness G, Dr. Wilms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rec uh, recommend the board approve the personnel matters as presented. Move for approval. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Approved. Thank you. Item B, budget amendment, capital outlay fund, budget amendment number four, appendix H, Mr. Hans. Let me turn that over to Mr. Mullen. <laughs> Thank you. I was originally scheduled to be out on um, Tuesday, and he oh. graciously <laughs> offered to take that for me. But um, I recommend that these amendments be approved as submitted. Motion to approve. Second. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Approved. Thank you. Item uh, C, change of school assignment, appendix I, Dr. Holliday. Move for approval. Second. Comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Approved. Item 9, under old business. Policy to second reading, a new policy on fraternization and policy 5400, naming of school system uh, facilities, Appendix J, Mrs. Nichols. As you pointed out, both of these are on for second reading, and we did not receive any feedback from board members or the community, so I'm asking that we approve both of them. Move for approval. Second. second. Comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Item B, uh, public utility easement agreement with Cape Fear Public Utility Authority at Eaton Elementary School, Appendix K, Mr. Hans. Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is uh, an item that's been on the agenda several times, and we recommend approval. And uh, Mr. Uh, Jim Fleckner from the Cape Fear Public Utility Authority is here. If uh, you would like uh, any, if you have any questions of uh, Mr. Fleckner, if you'd like him, he can, like to, he can come to the podium. It's up to you. So. Okay. Well, to begin with. Uh, it's been very informative to me in talking to Mr. Bullard in particular uh, in the past about uh, uh, easements in general and county and so forth. Uh, I don't know if any, if you or Mr. Bullard would like to go into any of that in detail as to how, if this differs in any way from what the county requires uh, as far as the, the easements that they grant. It, is this different, or, or what about this is, is different, if anything? And I didn't know, Mr. Bullard, because I knew you, you had researched it and you and I had talked. Uh, <coughs> no, this is, uh, <coughs> I would say this is uh, a fairly standard easement. It was altered somewhat from, uh, to, to tailor it to this particular site. Um, and it is, uh, as I understand it, just for a water line, it's for, um, the Public Utility Authority to uh, install a water line that would help them serve the community in that area and um, also to have a backup in case the, uh, the existing water line were to fail that serves the, the Eaton School. 
um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the other provisions of the easement, I would I would say that it was uh, something that is is not unusual. And I, because I, I kind of wanted to kind of review, and I'm sure we'll have some questions, but also. I think there were some concerns expressed uh, about future issues concerning security, possibly, and so forth. And uh, Mr. Hance, I know you and I had talked about that. Uh, it, and the, the question I know Dr. Hickens was the concern you had, that in the future, if we wanted to put a fence there, my understanding was that where this easement is located, that it, in no way would it impair our ability later if we wanted to put a fence up or security measure, measures that we wanted to take that it would impede us in any way. Did I understand that correctly? Or? Right, we would just back off from the back off from the easement and just place a fence right behind the easement. So not, you know, just outside the easement, within a foot of it. And place a fence or whatever else we wanted to put up at that, at that juncture, we just place it there <coughs> rather than in the easement. And I think there's also some concern. I would want, I, excuse me, I wouldn't want to put it in the easement because the chances, because if I put up a fence, I would want it anchored to such an extent, right. you know, that it would be deep enough, and I wouldn't want to place it across a top of the easement because there were too, too much capability, uh, possibility of uh, hitting a pipe that, that is under there. So I would either put it, I would put it back behind the easement, even if they allowed us to put it on there. I wouldn't recommend putting it on top of the easement. I would always put it behind an easement because I wouldn't want to hit the pipe. Yeah, right. and, and I understand, but there were some concerns expressed about what could not go on top of the easement, but that's what I thought was interesting in talking to Mr. Bullard, that the county actually puts in their easements the fact that you cannot do certain things on the easement itself. Was that right, Mr. Bullard? That's yeah, the county engineering's recommendation is that when develop developers propose uh, private developments and grant easements to the utility authority uh, for utilities, that the, the county will not approve it. Uh, approve the easements if the easements allow things to be built over top of the underground lines. They specifically exclude things like fences and other obstructions that could make it difficult to access and repair the underground lines. That's a county statute? It's a county policy. County policy? Do you have a copy of that? Uh, I don't have it with me, but I can pull it up on the iPad. What does it specifically say? Let me pull it up. Mr. When we discussed it, then. While we're waiting for that, I was concerned when I heard that some of the lines had already been run without the board's approval. Was this a flagrant disregard for the board's authority? I'm not aware. I guess Mr. Hans could address that. I'm not aware of any uh, of lines being run. I, I think there were other things. I thought that's what we got in the email from Mr. Hans. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, and I think Mr. Fleckner could speak with, to this. In the letter uh, addressed to Dr. Morkley dated the 7th of February, uh, he put in that letter that the authority, I'm quoting, installed a section uh, in an effort to minimize disruption during school operation. So a section outside of an easement. Is that correct? Just ready to come up. And that is correct. And, and there was some miscommunication internally within the authority as to which projects had easements secured and which didn't. These were done with our own crews, and they, they got some misinformation uh, and put in two sections of line without having the easement in place. And that was not in any way trying to disrespect uh, the authority of the school board or the decision of the school board. It was simply an error on our part. And I do apologize for that. Do you have the date of that installation? I do. One section was installed in April of 13, and the other section was installed in September of 13. And the third section was installed when the school itself was built. And that line is not in an easement either. And part of our request uh, to purchase an easement was to clean that up and get that in an easement so we can maintain it properly. And, and I understand um, your letter, uh, which is very nice, trying to put a, a nice face on this, uh, it almost sounds like in the letter that it was intentional that you did that because, because what you said was that in an effort to minimize disruption. So to make it clear, this was an accidental ingress onto school board owned property, it was not an intentional placement of lines in order to minimize disruption. 
they scheduled at a time that they thought school was out, <coughs> excuse me, but, th but they thought they had approval for the easements. So it was a well-intentioned act. Uh, it should not have happened, uh, and we do certainly apologize for that. And when did the authority become aware that they had inadvertently placed water lines in a piece of property to which they didn't have an easement? I became aware about two weeks ago, uh, and that was just about the same time that our crews became aware. They thought they had the easements, which is why they moved forward with the construction. And again, it was a, a, a miscommunication uh, effort or failure on our part, and we certainly apologize for it. Because uh, my, my children attend Eaton, actually, and so I, I regularly pick them up, and I, I think I'd seen a, a, a good deal of activity there back in September. And I had sent an email to Mr. Hans when I saw a, a large par portion of the area being torn up and, and worked on. And uh, mm. I, I was told at the time that, that those were all existing easements. But then going forward, uh, there was a lot of, while, while we were contemplating granting this easement, uh, there was a lot of work in the area where surveyors came in and really uh, did a pretty extensive job of surveying the area that was pertaining to the easement we're talking about tonight. Um, I understand mistakes happen, but uh, when, you're, when you're sitting over here, it seems that water lines were placed and then an easement was asked for afterwards, and I, I wonder if we ever would have been informed that water lines had been placed. Well, had had you, we just granted the easement back in October, I. I suspect we never would have been told that these water lines were placed inadvertently. Certainly when I found out, I, I let, let Mr. Hans know. Uh, but the lines have not been activated. They're not in service. Uh, they're simply in the ground. Uh, so if the board chooses to not approve sale of the easement to us, we will certainly remove them or abandon them. No, but I, I mean, I do think that this is in the, in the public interest, and uh, as your letter states, and I, and I, and I do think, and I, and I do want to grant an easement, uh, but, I, but I do have some concerns regarding safety. So as an example, your letter talks about uh, the, the placing of uh, uh, bollards at Laney High School within an existing easement, and that should this become something we wanted to do at Eaton that, you know, your, your team would expedite a review of this. Uh, but I will tell you that when I, uh, the first time this came before the board and we asked about placing a fence or some such structure in the easement, uh, I, I think we directed Mr. Bullard to speak with your counsel and I think we, it wasn't reviewed, it was summarily dismissed. If I, if, is that sort of an appropriate I'm not sure I understand. Well, well we, we asked if a fence would be possible, and it doesn't seem to me that the Cape Fear Public Utility Authority reviewed that request. Uh, essentially, your, their attorney just said that's not possible. Is that correct? As I recall from the conversation, I did speak to their attorney, and she said that, um, that I, believe, um, I believe she said that the utility authority could live with bollards being placed in the easement, but with respect to a fence, uh, they they would um, they they would not uh, they they did not uh, want to agree to that. Is that correct? That would be correct. Yes, I knew it was one or the other, but I want to make sure I got that correct. So they were okay with bollards, but not okay with fences. But then we didn't get to the question of if we place bollards and they have to be removed to repair the line, who would pay to replace the bollards? I, we we never got into that conversation. I mean, a question that I've raised several times, and it's about fencing, and I'm hearing from Mr. Hans that, you know, he might choose not to put a fence in an easement in, in any case, which is, again, the first time I've heard this is today. Uh, we've well, been, we've been just. As far as bringing the fence up, I wanted to bring it up last time, uh -huh. but it just kept getting removed. Uh, that's why I wanted to, to explain all that last time, because I had talked with Mr. Bowler, and that's why today is the first time, you know, we've discussed it. Oh, okay, but I mean, uh, it's been on the agenda. Was this the fourth time now or fifth uh, time? That we removed it. Right, it's on been the removed agenda. once. This is the first time. Well, no, twice. Mm -hmm. It's been removed. So no, we, no, no. Yes, we, we did. We deferred it once. and we removed it. Well, we it deferred it, time. but we discussed it and deferred mm -hmm. it. But we couldn't discuss it the last time because it was not on the agenda. Correct. Correct. 
because I was, I was hoping, again, the question I still have is in terms of consistency of the easement agreement, uh, you, the, the authority allows pavement over an easement. Typically we do, and we've worked with the city of Wilmington to have the cross city trail in some of our easements. Uh, parking lots are over our easements. We have roads uh, over our lines. So certainly As military pavement. cutoff showed this past week. Exactly, and that, that's also a good example of why these interconnects are so important. When we lost that pipe on military cutoff road, uh, we also lost pressure to the middle sound area. And we opened an interconnect that was existing and already constructed to feed that, that area from another source. Uh, so we were able to use one of those interconnects uh, to keep power to mid or to keep uh, pressure to middle sound. So when we talk about these things, there it's not just what if, they are real life examples. And that's why we are bringing this forward with the urgency that we are. And, and I agree that there's a, there's a public interest in providing this easement. My question, though, still go towards security, which has been one of the biggest issues for this board, and how it would be okay to pave over an easement but not place a fence in an easement. Because, uh, again, I have to believe that tearing up concrete paving is more difficult than removing a fence. And I think the difference, if I understood what Mr. Hintz, I don't know which conversation it was where we were talking about security fences that if you pave over something, and I'm, I don't know anything about it, feel free to correct. I don't know what the depth is that you're, you're putting the asphalt or concrete, whatever you're putting down, but I would think with the security fence where you're protecting the security of the school, you've got anchors going at quite some depth, I would think much more so than if you were paving, would that be a fair? It, de uh, it depends on what the fence is for. If the, if the fence is for security and you want it anchored, then you're gonna have to go down. And the reason I wouldn't put it over an easement is because if I went in and hit that pipe, then the liability would be on me to fix and repair that mm -hmm. pipe and, and get service back to, to the customers. And, and I wouldn't want that liability. So it depends. If the, if the easement is, is here and I have a 10 foot easement, and then I have two feet to place, a side to place a fence two feet outside the easement, is the security, depending upon what the security concern is, is the security concern such that that 10 or 12 feet is going to make a monumental difference in the security or the placement of that fence? Or do I need to place it, uh, which side of the easement do I need to place it on? I would, if the placement of the fence and the distance from the school is not the security concern, if it's just that I need a fence, then I would choose to place it on the outside of the easement rather than having uh, liability of, of, of breaking the pipe and, and repairing the pipe, I would put it there. And if I needed to restrict access and easement, I mean access, uh, vehicular access to a particular site, then you would wind up putting the, you would wind up putting concrete barriers there, causing cars to zigzag into the site and you would have a fence along with that. And if that's the case, if that's something that we want to do and something we want to consider at some of our sites, then certainly we would work with the utility authority to make those, make those things happen but I would still choose to put something that would be anchored deep in the ground where if it took a huge blow, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be moved or wouldn't move as much um, outside of an easement uh, as, as necessary. But if, you, if it's something that's light, if you're putting up something just to create a barrier for people parking there, like some bollards that we have in other places with a rope between them, and it's not something to prevent vehicular access, then that's different. And we could place something like that on the easement to keep people from parking there. I wouldn't object to doing that because we wouldn't be going down far enough, I wouldn't think, to strike to strike a pipe. But we would still be very careful if we chose if we chose to do something. But we would do something like that in concert with the public utility authority and not, you know, just do it on our own. Uh, does that yeah, that, that's my understanding, and I, and I can appreciate Dr. Hickey's concern <laughs> about security, but I, I just don't really quite understand what, I don't think you'd be recommending something to us. I mean, does this easement, or are there other easements at schools that, that we could also say this about? That there, Would there be a security? I mean, to me, they're everywhere, aren't they? Easement, easements are, all. we have easements all over the place, and we have easements with the right-of-way and near the right-of-way uh, in most of, our, most of our sites in order to pro provide uh, utilities uh, to, the, to the schools. If we chose to place a fence at any school, we would look to see where 
an easement existed and tried to place it somewhere outside of that easement, depending upon the, the necessity and depending upon what we wanted to do and what type of fence it was and what was the, you know, the impetus for the fence. Why did we, why did we want the fence? You know, is it just a chain link fence to pr prevent the kids from wandering off, or is it something truly to, uh, as Dr. Hickey was alluding to, truly for security to prevent you know, prevent access, and then is it going to be more than four feet high? It's probably going to be eight, ten feet high. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to be something that's really, that's really up there, and then I'm going to really anchor it. And then I'm going to, I'm going to have concrete abutments along there also to put, you know, there are a lot of different questions as to what you want, how you want it, why you want it there, as to how you would build it. What is it there for? You determine that, and then you determine how and what you're going to build. What is, you know, what is your, what is your need? I guess one of my concerns is that this current easement agreement essentially makes the this land unusable for us for anything other than uh, beautification purposes. So we, we can't put anything of use for any security without asking you in the future. But I, that's not true, is it? Well, what is true? That if, the, if the easement is there, if we wanted to put a fence up, we don't want to put it on there, we would back up a little bit. We wouldn't have to get anyone's approval, well, would we? Well, but to, to put, so what, what I'm saying, Mr. Hayes, is that once we convey this easement, should we convey this easement? I think there are good reasons to convey it, but should we convey this easement, then without the permission of the Public Utility Authority, we are unable to use this land for anything other than covering it with grass. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to call a question. Okay. But, but in just... The answer to that, Dr. Higgins, isn't that the same thing that, that would be true of any easement? That, that uh, you're giving up that easement well, at that particular time, except for grass or whatever, and if you have concerns about a fence that this would interfere with, then certainly we, I don't think we'd consider it. Well, my, my point I'm, is I'm that not that. E I'm easement not. agreements are just legal documents. Do I now? Easement agreements are legal documents between two parties that stipulate certain conditions. The Public Utility Authority could allow us to put fencing within school easements. Not saying that we're going to, but they could allow us to do it. And, and, that's, and that's my point. Uh, I, I know, Mr. Higgins, that it ends debate. I just wanted to make sure we got that thing up there. Uh, it also requires three-fifths vote, but we've never done it. We always just stop and, uh, and, and do it. Any, uh, Mr. Higgins has called the question, so the uh, item on the agenda is the public utility easement agreement with the Cape Fear Public Utility Authority. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Uh, oh. There needs to be a date change on the beginning of the to four, 2014. Is that? Um, on the easement agreement. On the, at the top. At the, the top, in the first okay. paragraph. Okay. Did you see that, Mr. Bullard? That, yeah, I'll, I'll change the date. Okay. And I'll also, just to make the board aware that um, the ease, the utility authority is compensating the board for the easement. The price is on the um, uh, in information sheet. Uh, Dr. Hickey has my iPad. Uh, but it's about $9,000. Um, and just to make sure the board is aware that the easement is being granted, yeah, $9,438 um, in return. That, that's what that's the amount they're paying for the easement so the, the motion should include approval of the price okay uh, so with the date change and, and we're aware of the price uh, let's have a show of hands all those in favor please raise your hands of approving those opposed passes five two uh, thank you uh, mr. Hayes uh, and we'll go off this topic now but Having said that, uh, Mr. Bullard uh, presented his iPad with the county engineering departments, uh, and it talks about property owner responsibility for stormwater conveyance, which is, of course, different than a, a water pipe, and, and he is correct for stormwater conveyance. But for utility easements, uh, it says, shall grant no additional utility easements uh, without first securing written authorization from the New Hanover County Water and Sewer District. Now, two things. Uh, obviously, this is outdated as we no longer have a New Hanover County Water and Sewer District, but I would take that to mean that 
with the permission of the public utility authority, you could put something up in an easement. So uh, in terms of the county not allowing it, that is incorrect. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda, item 10 of the new business. Uh, item A, bids for Hogwarts High School, uh, phase 11B, uh, HVAC improvements, Mr. Hans. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, request that the board approve the uh, bids for Harvard High School HVAC. Move for approval. Second. Comments, <laughs> questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Item B, uh, ENGL Toolkit License Sole Source Resolution Appendix to Ms. Brimson. Request that the board approve the ENGL Toolkit License Sole Source Resolution. Move for approval. Second. Questions? Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Item C, uh, Thinking Maps, Sole Source Resolution, Appendix N, Ms. Brinson. Request the board approve the Thinking Maps, Sole Source Resolution. Move for approval. Second. Questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Item D, Technology Plan, Appendix O, Ms. Brinson. Request that the board approve the Technology Plan. Move for approval. Second. Are there any questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. Item E, we will postpone until our closed session, then we'll come back out into open session. We'll address item E. Uh, item F, make updates, appendix to you, Dr. Marco. Yeah, the original one that was in your packet dealt with a four-day makeup situation. So obviously, uh, we're now in, I mean, we're in a six-day makeup situation. Dr. Mark, I'm sorry, but it's not up there. Which PowerPoint presentation is it? I'm sorry. The one dealing with uh, makeup, day. makeup days. Okay, not a problem. We'll make it work. Uh, keep it simple. We have six days we have to make up. You've got a requirement of either 185 days or 1,025 school hours. There are some additional considerations. High schools in particular are, are a major factor. They're on semester schedules. So that means that the first semester folks are done and we're starting a new course with those high school folks. They even affect every single day they miss is almost like a double day. So as when we look at the options of how to make this up, there are a number of options you can consider. Saturday school which was our original consideration. Additional school days at the end of the school year. Memorial Day. Veterans Day is legally protected and you can't go to school on Veterans Day. The same protection doesn't exist for Memorial Day. So that would have been an option. Spring break, or adding time to the school day. I think for our first four days, we had talked about eliminating half days and adding June 13th. That recommendation doesn't change. For the two additional days, Instead of doing a Saturday school next week on the 22nd, my recommendation is that for the entire month of March, we add 30 minutes to the school day. 15 minutes at the beginning, 15 minutes at the end. Uh, to add only 10 minutes or 15 minutes by itself, I don't think is necessarily the, is a strong instructional block. But if we add 30 minutes to the day, that's a, a strong instructional block that I think schools can use to try to work with their students to, to make up this. It is not a perfect solution. Uh, but at this point, I don't think there is a perfect solution. The governor yesterday said he would look at this and offer some, some talk to some folks and maybe make some, uh, some help with this. We appreciate that if he does. But until he does that, then I think we need to look at the month of March doing 30 minutes a day, 15 minutes at the front and at the back to help make up the, the time. Mr. Hans looked at the transportation aspect of this, and it doesn't impact what we do with transportation other than 15 minutes earlier, 15 minutes later. It has the least impact on our current school operations and gets us back some of that time for the high school as well as for the other schools. Okay. So the, the six, make sure I understand, there are six days that we have to make up. Right, we had originally had the four days and we had talked about eliminating two half days and adding, making June 13th a school day. So that Those, takes care of the four. 
Well, it's it, we're still Close. over. It's, yeah, that's we're, what is it? Two and a half. Yes, yeah, two actually. and a half. We're still over the thousand twenty-five hours. Uh, my primary, one of my primary concerns again is that high school piece where every day we miss this semester is a double hit to them compared to students because it doesn't because they're only they started in January. Now, did you see? Uh, and I forwarded it to you. I don't know how many other board members see. I thought it was really uh, good. The young lady, uh, I think it was Ashley High School. Yeah. Uh, sent, uh, did everybody receive that? Mm -hmm. What her recommendation was yeah. about testing on, on test days? Yeah, she hers was a testing schedule, and I think it's got uh, some merit to look at. Uh, well, and that would really favor high schools, which is what you're, you're really trying to address. Because mm -hmm. uh, I like the idea of the 30 minutes uh, during the month of March rather than spring break or Saturdays. Uh, uh, yeah. So I, I would ask the board to approve the following. The elimination of the half days, the addition of June 13th as a student day, and then 30 minutes added to the school day, 15 minutes at the front, 15 minutes at the, at the back. And then if the governor does offer some alternative in terms of forgiving time, then we would look at that if, it's, if it comes forward. I move for approval of Dr. Markley's recommendation. I'll second. Okay, now the school now was supposed to get out June the 12th. Correct, now we'll get out June 13th, which is a Friday. Cause because the, the only other thing I'd like to see is just maybe if the governor were to approve it, because we have met the 1,025. Correct. Just, you know, I like everything except the 13th. Uh, the, just. So if the governor comes back and says we can forgive a day, we can come back and look at the 13th. Because uh, I look at the feasibility of the, you know, how much is really going to be accomplished. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. uh, but I like, I like that. We have a motion well, second. Well, Dr. Markley, have Make you, did better. all the yeah. high school principals principals weigh in on this? What did they say? We did a survey to all of our principals, and <coughs> far and away, adding time to the day was the was the top option. I can tell you it was the bottom one for my twins, but, yeah. oh well. It was what, Ms. Easton? It was the bottom. That was, that was the, the least they, they wanted to go to Saturday. Oh, is that right? Yes, they did. Yeah. Get it all over with in one chunk. <laughs> Worked for me. Uh, any other comments or questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, so just to note, there will not be Saturday school on the 22nd now. Can we open the schools for Miss uh, Eastep's children that day? <laughs> <laughs> Plus have them go extra. <laughs> All those in favor, say aye. aye. <laughs> Tell me we give them a choice, Ms. Eastep. Those that want to yeah. show up, show up. Yeah. <laughs> Mail it in. Okay, call to the audience has been taken care of. Any correspondence, any board members would like to share? Uh, under announcements, uh, we have our legislative breakfast Tuesday, February 18th. Dr. Markley has talked about it, 8 a.m. in this room. Uh, our next regular board meeting will be March 4th, uh, 5.30 uh, here in, in the center. Uh, any other announcements? The uh, uh, budget planning committee will meet Wednesday at 1 o'clock. Wednesday at 1. At, uh, down at the uh, room 301 at the administration. Room 301 at the administration <laughs> building. Yeah. No, it's at 330. 330? Yeah. I thought it was, okay. All right. Wednesday, 330, I'm sorry. 330. Is that not yeah. correct? That is That's correct. That's what I have not all on right. my schedule. I had 1 o'clock in my calendar. <coughs> but, uh, all right, 330. And uh, if we need to, we may have to meet again on Thursday. The only other thing I'll announce is the what I alluded to earlier, and uh, just received a phone call yesterday from the chair of Wake County's Board of Education about trying to put together a meeting of the ten largest systems. I guess we made it. We're what number ten in the state. We're in that large district consortium. We we fluctuate somewhere around ten, eleven, sometimes twelve. But, but they're trying to put together a meeting, and I told her I would like to attend Thursday right. up in Greensboro to address the concerns that the teachers brought forward, and that we also have discussed as far as the twenty-five percent and the other issues. Uh, next, we'll need a motion to go into co closed session. Uh, North Carolina General Statutes one forty-three three eighteen eleven A one and one fifteen C three nineteen. Uh, 321, that's uh, purchase of land, Mr. Bullard, and also personnel? Yes. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, the one cited um, is is uh, 
actually incorrect when it should, instead of A1, it should be A A3, A5, and A6 for personnel, land acquisition, and attorney-client privilege. Move for us to go into closed session for those reasons. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank we you. We are. by the restroom. Mr. Hayes. Yeah. Yes. Can we? Yep. Okay. Take your time, man.